the house of the Lord. I am just, I've, I've definitely gained a few kilos over this past week. Who, who, who relates? I, I definitely have eaten way too many pineapple tarts, way too much bakwa, way too much, what's the other one? Almond, the almond cookies and the peanut cookies. There's so many. There's actually, this year, I've actually been introduced to more types of cookies than any of the years People have been really creative with their biscuits this year. I, I don't know. Maybe it's because we haven't had um, a reunion, a proper reunion in quite a few years. Um, but welcome back for some of those who have been traveling uh, out station and have just returned back to KL. Welcome you back. Thank God you're safe. And for those of you who are still, maybe you're watching online from your hometown, when you get back, may there be safe travels. Um, speaking of which, welcome to those online. <laughs> It's great that you are joining us here. Uh, if you're new with us, anyone in the hall or even online, why don't you uh, scan this QR code? We would love to connect with you. You are so precious to us and you are our very, very, very important people. You know, there are some wonderful people that would love to meet you just outside in the foyer if you haven't already. Um, you know, put your name down. Meet, they would love to meet you, talk with you, connect with you, ask you a few questions, and maybe see if you would like to be part of this uh, wonderful and vibrant church. So um, why don't we uh, actually stand up? Let's all stand up. And why don't we just say hi to about five people? Let's go around, say hi. Hello, hello. Hi, hi, hello. Yes. It's always good to see the church interact with each other. Everyone's just like come in and it's like, everyone's so cold. <laughs> Temperature's okay, right? <laughs> yeah, say hi to a few people. And you may take your seat after that. Praise the Lord. So good to see all of you. We're going to enter into a time of giving. And, and giving is probably one of my favorite things to do. Um, generosity is such a core uh, value to a Christian. You know, not just generous with our finances, but generous with our time, with our talents, and so on. And I'd just like to read a portion of Scripture from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields, and I will not drop your fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. There is something about giving. There is something about giving. It, it, I often hear this saying, right? It is more blessed to give than to receive. I wonder why that is. In our, in our normal mindset, we often think, oh, you know, we should... We should keep for ourselves. If we give away, we will have less, but not in the kingdom of God. No. As you give, God is the one who will provide for all your needs. Amen? God is the one who will provide for your needs, and you will be blessed. Not just financially, your family will be blessed. Amen? Your ministries will be blessed. Your work will be blessed. Your careers will be blessed. The things that you do will receive so much favor and so much blessing. Amen? So why don't we uh, just pray, and then we will, we will enter into a time of giving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you see our offerings. You see what we are about to give unto you, O Lord. We thank you that you have provided for us. We thank you that you have blessed us, O God. With whatever we have in our hands, Lord, we give it back to you, O Lord. May you multiply this offering. May this offering further your kingdom. May it bless your people. May it bring blessing and your word to those who have not heard it yet. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are ways to give, obviously, on the screen. For those online, you can give using the QR code or the details down here on the screen as well. Hallelujah. There are a few announcements that I'd like to um, just communicate to you really quickly. Next month, we're doing something called Family Month. You know, family is one of the core values of our church, and we're going to dedicate an entire month just to talking about topics that revolve around the family. Now, Family Month will be a combined services on these dates, so there will be no youth church. Um, I think kids, some, some of the kids uh, will have church, some of them will not for certain ages. So uh, stay tuned for a little bit more details. We will also be having um, topics that... Um, are very relevant, rele really, really relevant to not just, you know, 
if you think family, it's usually like, oh, Christian family. But no, no, it's more than that. It's, it's so much more than that. Family is designed by God. It is a covenant relationship designed by God. So why don't you invite your friends, maybe extended family who do not know the love of Christ yet. And I think this will be a great uh, evangelistic opportunity. Amen. And for those online as well, why don't you invite some people to watch it with you? Share the link online or maybe invite them to service in person as well. And I think they will be blessed. Amen. During one of these weeks will be also a, something we call Power Week. As you can see on the screens, we, we've, we're really cool these days. We omit the vowels. So it's just, it's still pronounced power, don't worry. And we'll have a guest speaker all the way from Melbourne, Australia. And his name is Pastor Louis Cabral. Um, stay tuned for more details. They're coming soon. We'll probably announce it next week. Um, but it's going to be an impactful week. We're going to be building prayer altars. We're going to be uh, seeking revival in this nation and in our homes. Amen. Isn't that just a great thing to expect? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Last but not least, our equip semester is starting up again. Who loves to be equipped? Who loves to be to to dive into the Word of God? You know, I. I when I was growing up, I never loved, I never really had a heart for the Word of God. Like it was there, I read it, but something in me really shifted and I dove in and I really, really love being equipped. I really, really love the Word of God. So if you love the Word of God or you're looking to maybe stir up that passion, equip, these equipped classes are um, just for you. So when they do come out and when they do get released onto the, to register, Go register for them. In fact, um, one of these classes is the Missions Exposure Program. Who, who here has been to missions before? Could I get a raise of hands? Yeah, some people. If you haven't, guess what? Missions is not just for those who are called to missions. In fact, it is exactly that. Everyone is called to missions. Everyone is called to spread the gospel. It is part of the Great Commission to go to all nations, right? All tribes and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. How do we do that? We go out. We are sent out. Maybe some of it may be local missions. Maybe some of it may be overseas. But whatever it is, if you would like to partake on a missions trip with this church, the Missions Exposure Program is a prerequisite. The details will be on the screen. Um, it is on the 11th and the 25th of February. 2 to 4 p.m. It's a Saturday. 2 to 4 p.m. at Logos 2. Logos 2 is next to Hosanna Hall. So please sign up. Sign up via the QR code. Sign up via the, the Church Center app. And it will be an amazing time. So why don't we be upstanding? Up, everyone, up to your feet. We're going to enter into a time of worship. But before that, why don't we give the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords the worth that He deserves. Come on, church. You can do better than that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Church. Good morning. Good morning to everyone here and online. Truly in Psalms 100, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So if you have something to be thankful this morning, that something he has done in the past or you're believing to come, let us just praise God and give him all that we have. Amen. Day in history, death is beaten. You have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal. You have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive.
what a glorious way. Awesome, awesome day. It is today, amen, church? Every day is an awesome day because we have been redeemed. We have been saved. We have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And you know what? I'm just reminded that, you know, on that cross, Jesus won that victory. And He won it. You know, when He won it, He said, It is finished. It is finished. You know, we don't have to strive. Because it is finished. No matter what we go through in this life, we know that the victory has already been won. Amen, church? Alright, we're gonna sing this song together. It's a song about God's love and how when we are in His love, there's nothing that can hold us back. We sing this, when darkness when darkness strives to rule over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Hey. Shame no longer, shame no longer has a place to hide. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken And my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love Stand a chance when I stand in your love. Come on, we sing. There is power. There's power that can break up every chain. There's power that can empty out the grave. Oh, there's resurrection power that can save.
I just encourage you to just lift up your hands and just thank God for His love. Just thank God for His love. God, we thank you. We thank you for your love, Lord. We thank you for your love. Your amazing, faithful, enduring love. church as a we're embarking on this season with a theme of shift I was praying you know to the Lord and just asking him what is in store for me personally and what is in store for our church and I just felt God reminding me of this one truth about himself that he is a faithful God that you know no matter what that shift may be God is the God who saw us through <laughs> and He will continue to see us through. He is the God who, who whatever He starts, He will complete <laughs> because He is a faithful God. When, uh, when Joshua was about to lead the Israelites into the promised land, God gave him a promise. He said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. <laughs> Amen. And I'm just reminded, you know, that wherever we go, it doesn't matter what obstacles we may face, because the God that is in me, the God that is in you is greater. And He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Amen. Thank you. So we're going to sing this song, and it's a song of surrender. It's a song of trust. And together as a church, you know, I just want us to, to declare this as one body and say, Lord, we are here. We are here. Our whole self, Lord, we are here to follow you. Wherever you lead us, Lord, we will follow you. And we will trust in you, Lord. Seen it together. Here is where. Here is where I lay it down. Every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender And I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to And I will make room for you To do whatever you want to do whatever you want to
believe God has whispered or said a word of assurance to many of you here. Receive His word. Receive His promise. Be reminded that He is a good God. A God that will see you through. He has seen you through in the past. He has seen you, seeing you through in the present and He will see you through in the days to come. Lord, we love to be in your presence. Because in your presence, oh God, is where heaven and earth are right there at the same time. That while we are present, Father, in all our circumstances, in all our situations, God, we know that your presence is with us. Going through every single day, every single moment, every single challenge, every single victory, you are there with us. So we ask, oh God, that you will continue to inhabit in the praises of your people. Not just visit, but inhabit in the praises of your people. Stay right here. Work, Lord, in our hearts. Work, Lord, in our spirit, oh God. Speak to us so powerfully, so clearly, oh God. Continue, oh God, to bring about that assurance into all our hearts, into all our spirits. So we're ready for more of you. For we ask and we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen and amen. Come on, let's give him the praise. Remain standing. I want us to read the Word of God together. Today I'm taking my scripture from Mark chapter 8, verse 22 to 26. Let's read this scripture together at a count of three. One, two, three. They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hand on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. This year, our emphasis is shift. And I believe it's such a powerful theme, a thrust that we are stepping into because, you know, the nation is shifting, the government has shifted, we've got a unity government, and things are shifting even in our national level. And then in our church, there's been shifts going on as well, different things that are happening, you know, the new things that are done, there's a grace for, to experience the new things even as, as we step into this new season together. But far and beyond just the national level and the corporate church level, I believe that there is an anointing in this house for that shift to happen in your life and in my life. Can somebody say amen? That this shift is for you and for me. I want you to declare this with me. Say, this is my shift. Come on, say it together. Come on, say it like you believe it. One more time. This is my shift. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. If you believe that, turn around to your neighbor and tell someone, type it in the chat. This is my shift. Turn around to your neighbor and greet them in the name of the Lord before you take your seats. Amen. This is my shift. Wow, I just realized this looks like some fast and furious title, you know. Yeah, this is my shift. And uh, you know, in the month of December, January, I was doing a devotion from the books, from the Gospels, right? So you know, the Gospels have got... Um, are very similar in a lot of their stories, especially the first three books, the Synoptic Gospels, right? So they are written from different eyes, different writers, but from their different angles that they are looking at things, but they're mentioning similar events and also talking about uh, similar places. Okay, so this particular scripture intrigued me very much. And I'm going to tell you why it intrigued me in a bit, but I want you to know it's very, very exciting. When you read the Bible, when you read the Gospel, you know, even when I was doing a devotion initially, it was like, oh my goodness, it's the same miracle, and I'm reading it again in this, in this chapter, and I'm reading again in this book. And, you know, but when, when you actually put pieces together and you realize that when they show up all these pieces, it makes a whole picture so much clearer. Okay, so this was a very powerful scripture to me, and I want you to follow on with me. So it's a very unusual story. Jesus had 
just healed the 4,000. So in Mark chapter 8, the beginning of that chapter, talks about how Jesus had, so, sorry, not healed, fed the 4,000. So he fed the 4,000, the miraculous signs of feeding the 4,000 was there. And then he walks and passes by this particular town called Bethsaida. Everybody say Bethsaida. Bethsaida, okay. So he passes on this Bethsaida and there were a group of people that brought a blind man okay, to him. Nothing unusual about it. Lots of people come to Jesus, right? Lots of people want their friends to be healed. So he brought, they brought this blind man to him. But the unusual, but then again, there's always, nothing is usual when Jesus shows up. You know what I mean? Nothing is usual when Jesus shows up. Because every time Jesus shows up, He shifts our mindset, He shifts our understanding, He shifts the way we do things, He shifts, um, he shifts our, our thoughts, our emotional, whatever condition, spiritual condition, He shifts things. So while it was a very usual thing, it was also a very unusual thing when Jesus showed up. I believe God is doing that in many, one, in many of us today as well. You know, I, I want to say this to us, business cannot be as usual. Okay, three people agree. <laughs> After all we've been through, come on guys, business cannot be as usual. Amen? Business cannot be as usual. Business cannot be as usual because when Jesus shows up, it's never usual. If He shows up in your business, if He shows up in your life, if He shows up in your child's life, it will not be usual. Something will change, something will change shift. And that shift happened in that man. And that man's life, things became more clear and clearer and clearer for him. Okay, the Bible tells us that. It became clearer and clearer for him. And now if we all want that shift together, some things have got to move in our lives. Some things have got to shift in our lives. Some things have got, got to take place before that shift can take place in your life and my life. Amen? Alright, so let's go on to, let's, let's see what needs to move. Firstly, he needs to move, this man needs to move out of where he was. You need to move out from where you are. If you want a shift to happen in your life, you need to move out from where you are. Now, I told you that this portion of scripture was very interesting. The man was brought by his friends to Jesus. It says here in verse 22 and then verse 23, it says, Jesus took the man... The friends brought him to Jesus, but Jesus took the man by the hand and led him outside the village. Hmm, very interesting. Then it says in verse 26, after Jesus had healed him, Jesus said to him and sent him home and saying, don't even go into the village. Means he was not even allowed to go home. Go back to that way. Okay? Don't go back that way. What a strange thing to happen. You know, remember when Jesus, when uh, the four friends bought the, the lame man and lowered him from the roof, Jesus healed him there and then. He didn't wheel him outside and say, come, let's get healed. Let me get you healed outside here. No, has he, you know, he's always, most of the time, healed people on that instance wherever they are at. Right? He will, he will just do, you know, wherever, like, wherever there's a woman with the issue of blood, he will just heal them there and then. It was that that was how it was. But so strange that this particular instance, Jesus, when they brought, the friends brought him there, they led this man, blind man, out of the village before Jesus prayed for him. What an interesting thing to happen. Now I've invited a friend to come on stage with me to share some experience with you because of his visual impairment. He's got a genetic condition that has caused him to be visually impaired, and it's com almost completely, he's almost completely visually impaired. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome on stage, Jen Xiao. Thank you, Jen. Jen, you are standing on stage with me. And uh, this entire church, even our online friends are watching us, all right? Don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we just want to hear from you, all right? And uh, I think Jen said he started having this condition about 10, 20, 20 years, years ago. 20 years ago. And it's just degenerated by, through the years, and now it's almost, almost all gone. Yeah. So we just want to trust God for him. But I want him to share and experience his experiences with us. Okay, Jen, I want you to tell us, tell the church, how do you move around in your house? What, how do you navigate in your home? 
by memory. I was a photographer before I went blind. So I, being a photographer, I'm very visual. So I look at things I remember. So I could sort of mind map the surroundings. So I'm very at home in my condo. I can move around unless my wife decides to move the furniture. You know? <laughs> then, yeah, then there'll be problems. But thank God that my memory is still very good. And that's why there's no fear when I'm in, in the house. You know? But when I go outside, it's a totally different cup of tea. You know? As uh, the environment is different, I start to be scared. Fear mm. comes in. Right. So generally, when you move out to an unfamiliar space, there's fear and there is... How, how do you navigate that usually? Initially, a lot of anxiety uh, because I'm scared of falling on steps. Yeah. I'm scared of falling on manholes. I'm scared of knocking into other people. And also, of course, walking into traffic. Maybe. But <laughs> after a while, I find that I could trust the Lord that He's not going to let me fall flat on the road. So somehow there's this little extra sense of uh, um, assuredness that when I walk using my cane, I will make sure the steps are tap everywhere. And when I'm not sure, I'll just stand and ask people. You know. Of course, I do make a lot of mistakes. Many times in the departmental stores, I say sorry to the mannequin because I <laughs> didn't know they're human or not. So, but over time, I realized that uh, I need not have to fear. Yeah, of course, I need someone to help me. But many friends, although with good intentions, they are not trained caregivers. Mm. So they also let me walk into the glass of the of a shopping mall. So it is, uh, yeah, I have to be very careful. But I believe that I'm well protected. Wow, thank yeah. you so much. Come on, let's give Jen a hand. Yeah. Thank you so much for your sharing. Really, really yeah. appreciate you. Come on, let's continue to pray for Jen. Can God reverse the order of things? Yeah. Amen. Come on, let's trust God for His healing. Everybody stretch off their hand. Let's trust God for Jen's healing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for this life. A life, Father, that God that has that has seen the glory of God even in the midst of darkness in the eyes, but yet the glory of God has shown through his life. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus, we continue to speak healing upon Jen's eyes. Lord, that God, you will reverse the order of the genes that have caused this impairment. And God, we speak healthy genes of God to regenerate in the name of Jesus. Lord, healthy genes in the optical nerves and everything of God to reconnect, oh God, and that God, a miracle can take place right now in the name of Jesus. We trust you, Father for his life, that you will continue to protect him and surround him like a mighty shield. And yes, Lord, he will not fall to the ground flat because his God is with him every step of the way. We thank you for his life. We thank you for all that he's been through and yet continues to stand strong, being a testimony of your goodness and of your grace in his life. We're encouraged by it today. In Jesus' name, we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, Dorothy will leave you there. Thank you. So, I wanted us to understand this. For a visually impaired person, to be out of a familiar place, it can be quite daunting and it can be quite scary for them. They are not familiar with places. She was saying, yeah. in the first service, we had uh, another brother, Brother Mark, who also said the same thing, you know, as long as my wife doesn't move things around, I will be okay in the house. You know, and uh, if, as long as there's nobody changing the position of the sofa or, or changing and putting a chair in the pathway, they'll be okay because they recognize. In fact, they will recognize, you know, how many steps. Okay, if I come out of this room, if I take two steps to my, to my right, I know that the switch is here. If I take two, two steps to my left, this is there. So they know exactly because it's by memory and it's a familiar place. Why did Jesus have to take this man out of his familiar place before he healed him? Why did Jesus have to remove him from amongst his friends, amongst his family, the place that he was so familiar with, and after he was healed, tell him, don't go back to that place or so? I want to say this to us. Sometimes when God shifts us, you've got to get out of your familiar places. You've got to get out of your familiar places, the places which you knew how things are done, how things are supposed to operate, how things are supposed to be. You want a shift in your life, you want something fresh in your life, then you need to learn to get out from where you are. The familiarity will breed contempt. 
Because all this while it has been done this way, it's been done in a way comfortable in this situation that we don't dare to trust God for the next steps of our lives. And yet God challenges us through this scripture to say, if you dare to walk out with me, I will bring about that clarity in your life. I will bring about a new thing to happen in your life. Whether, whatever situation it is, whatever it is, I don't know what familiar situations that you are in, but God says, get out. It's time to move out. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. I love what Jen said. You know, he knows that God is with him. He knows God is with him. Another thing about this, of why Jesus needed to move this man out from that familiar, out of Beth Bethsaida into another place before he healed him was this. The word Bethsaida, the name Bethsaida, I told you that this scripture caught my attention because as I was doing this devotion, I was read from Matthew first, right? Matthew, then Mark. So when I, when I remembered this particular word, I, I cross-referenced back to the book of Matthew. And in the book of Matthew chapter 11, something very interesting came up. It was the mention of this town. Okay, I want us to look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 to 22. Okay, Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 to 22. It says here, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed, because they did not repent. Woe to Chorazin! Woe to you! Bethsaida. For if miracles were performed in you, had been performed in Tyre and in Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and in ashes. In ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Wow. Bethsaida was a town that Jesus denounced and Jesus cursed. Bethsaida was a place where Jesus denounced because of their unbelief. He had been to this town before. He had performed signs and wonders before, but the people were unrepentant. And that's why, you, now I get it, I understood why Jesus had to lead this man out from Bethsaida to another place before he touched him and he healed him because that was a town where so much unbelief, so much criticism, so much people who were yiki yaking, yiki yaking about and commenting about how he did things and how, what, what he healed and whether it's true or not. Unrepentant people, unrepentant hearts were there. And when Jesus curses a place, remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree, what happened to the fig tree? It withered and it died. I want to say this to us. Some of us are in situations where it's already unfruitful. It's already unfruitful. The situations that you are in is already unfruitful. It's no longer bearing fruit like how it used to bear fruit. It's no longer doing, producing things that it used to produce. And it's time for us to move out from there. It's time for us to move forward from there and not go back to those things again. I'm not talking about people around you are cursed or a specific place is cursed. It's not a literal thing. I'm trying to say that there are things and there are situations and there are environments that are unhealthy. And we cannot keep on staying in those unhealthy environments if you want the Lord to shift in your life. If you want the Lord to do something new in your lives. Can somebody say Amen. He wants to do something new. That's why he took this man out from this place. In fact, he told him, don't tell anyone. No, I mean, he didn't say that, but it's almost to say that how he always tells the rest of the people, don't tell anybody. But he told him, don't go back to this place. What a weird thing for it to happen for a blind man who was so familiar with this old place not to go back to that place. Don't go back to your old ways. Don't take one step forward and two step backs. Perhaps it's a habit that you need to kick. Perhaps it's something that you need to, to get rid of. And sometimes we move forward, but we take a few steps back and we go back to where that place is, that unhealthy environment, that unhealthy attitude, that unhealthy mindset all over again. But the Lord says to you, if you want to shift in your life, get out of where you are. Get out of where you are because God is doing something new in our lives. Amen? Amen? Oh, okay, only three people believe this. Come on, God is doing something new in all our lives. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. We got to believe it. And I don't want, let's not remain status quo in the comfort zone. Because when you get out is where you experience God in a way that you have never experienced before. This man stepped out by faith. He's probably never been out of that village without his friends, the familiarity of his family. But he stepped out by faith and God healed him. Wow. How exciting. How exciting is that? Second thing that needs to happen for us to have a shift in our lives is this. We've got to get out of the box. Get out of the box. I know we've heard many people, get out of the box, don't limit God in. But you know what? We always still do. Because we know we think that if God had done it this way before, God will do it again this way. If God had done it to ABC that way, I should, I, 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 He should be doing the same thing to me in the same way as well. Why can't He do that same thing? How come, how come He has healed some people instantaneously? How come I don't see that healing yet? How come I, you know, He's given favour to this person, but how come I don't see that right now? God works in ways that you and I cannot explain. Now, it's not a, it's not a formula to pray for people. There's no formula to pray for people. Eddie, Irene, you would know this. It's not a formula. There's no, let's say, dear God, three times, and then amen five times, then you'll be healed. There's no superstitions in this. God does it the way He wants to do it, in His time. It doesn't mean that if we miss one amen, we're one amen short, alamak, no wonder I didn't get healed. It doesn't work that way. Why did Jesus have to spit on this man? Why did Jesus have to spit on this man? Sometimes he could have healed. Lots of times Jesus just healed by the word of his mouth. He declares it and they are healed. Sometimes he lays hands on them. Sometimes he has mud on them and he puts it on their face, on their, on their eyes. He gets healed. But why did Jesus have to spit on this man? And perhaps when God does certain things in our lives, you know, it, it's, it's quite disgusting. Lah. Can you imagine... Today, you know, can you imagine if you're going out for healing? Then <laughs> people spit at your uh, face and spit at your eyes specifically, and then rub your eyes and say, Oh, in Jesus' name, be healed. Like, mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if the, Lord, if the Lord speaks specifically to do that, then I trust that God will speak specifically to the whoever who is being, who's praying for you. Okay, it can be any way. So what I'm trying to say is, in this particular instance, it was uncomfortable. It was disgusting. It was unacceptable. You don't spit at people. You don't spit at people. Where do people spit at people? You know? Where, you know and, and this guy was spat at. And God works differently when He starts shifting us, when He starts moving things, when He starts changing things in our lives, you will start feeling uncomfortable. You will start feeling uneasy. You will start saying that, well, why, why, why are things not like before? You know, why can't things happen like before? When God starts shifting this church in ways that, that you and I cannot even ask, think, or imagine, probably some of us will be thinking that, what's, what's up with this, man? And we will probably think, what is wrong? How come? How come things are done this way now? It's so unlike before. It's so un not, not the conventional way. But Jesus spat at this man. Do you question that? His methods are always higher than ours. His ways are always higher than ours. And sometimes, it takes a humbling situation before we're ready for what is ahead of us. Being spat on is something that is very humbling. And yet, it takes a humbling situation before God promotes you. You know, I, I really like Facebook, and I know that when I say this, because then you'll know that I'm of a certain generation. 
because only a certain generation uses Facebook now, because the younger generations don't use Facebook anymore. They are into their Instagram and TikToks, etc. right? So, yes, I am one of those in that generation, okay? And I use, and Facebook is a very powerful tool because a lot of times they, it shows you memories, memories of what you had typed, what you had posted many years ago. So several, several, no, several days ago as I was preparing this, one of the Facebook memories that popped up was from 14 years ago. Okay, 14 years ago, a Facebook memory t popped up and I had written on my status, typed in my status, pray for me, hair is falling. Exactly 14 years ago, in this period of time, I started losing hair in early January and, and within a span of three months, I lost all my hair because of an autoimmune problem. Some of you have heard this story, but you have not seen it before. Okay, I, hang on, don't show the picture yet, okay? It was a very, very difficult season and um, it felt like as if God allowed it and He allowed, he allowed this, that situation. I had an autoimmune, uh, my, my immunity was attacking my hair follicles and all my hair came off. So I had gone to see a dermatologist and the dermatologist told me this, oh, your hair is in a dormant state, which means there were no, not even small little buds coming out. It was dormant, it was bald. He looked at it and he went, hmm, it may or may not come back lah. Then I'm like, wow, gee, I so could have diagnosed myself like this, you know. I paid you 300 over ringgit and you tell me it may or may not come back. But okay, so anyway, I he saw the doctor and that was the diagnosis. Uh, I, had, I had alopecia areata. Usually alopecia areata is area baldness. One spot, two spots. But mine became one spot, two spot, three spot, and they became one big happy family and became one big spot. And then it went on and on until all my hair was lost within the, in the span of three months. And I hardly took any pictures. Okay, I, I didn't take pictures unless I had a cap on or a scarf on. But I had one particular picture that I had to take because I went to renew my IC and make my IC again. And I, um, I, I went there with a white scarf. So this is a public service announcement, okay? If you have a scalp problem or hair problem, please do not wear white scarf to go and take your IC picture. They will ask you to remove it. You can wear any other coloured scarf, but you cannot wear white. So doin doin me, I wore a white scarf. And I was already at the IC there. They said, ah, keluarkan scarf, scarf putih tak boleh. Cannot use the white scarf. So I had to take off my white scarf. So this is the picture that was taken of me three weeks as I started to have the hair fall. And I had already a big patch of baldness right here. If you can bring it up. That was just three weeks. And within the span of three months, as I mentioned, all the hair came off. And it was a very humbling moment. My crowning glory was completely gone. Nobody prepares you for something like that. I know some of you who are going through chemotherapy and you have had hair loss. I know how it feels. And I was really, really sad. I, I, you know, I, I said, God, how am I ever going to serve you again? How am I going to stand on stage and lead worship and preach or do whatever, lah, you know, with like this, this kind of condition? How... how it was, how, how can I do this? How can I grow? I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do that anymore. How am I going to, to face people? How am I going to talk to people? How am I going to come to church? It was all about how, how, how I could do this and how I could do that. And I remember very distinctively that day, one day the Lord spoke to me in the toilet. How many of you know God doesn't excuse himself when you're in the toilet? There you go. So you think you think you can do certain things in the toilet? Excuse me, Jesus is right there, okay? Yeah, so he's right there and he spoke in the toilet, I remember. I was sitting there and God spoke, Gwen, it's not what you can or cannot do for me. I love you for who you are. Wow. Well, let's give God the glory for that. I'm so glad, you know, he spoke at that time. Because you know what? It was a very definitive moment for me. That moment was my shift. Because I thought that it was all about me doing things. I must do this. I must do that. How am I going to do this anymore? How am I going to do that anymore? And those things, guess what? Doesn't make him love me more. Those things doesn't make him love me more. He loves me for who I am. So at that very definitive moment, I remember crying in the, in the toilet and, and I told God this. I said, God, 
with or without hair, I will continue to serve you. And it was not just about hair. It was basically teaching me that whether you have much, whether you have little, whether you, are, you have it all together, whether you are blessed, whether you have, you have everything together or don't have it together, will you still serve me? And that was what God spoke to me at that day. Whether, and I made that decision on that day, that shift in my heart, in my spirit that day to say that whether with or without hair, I will serve you. And I'm still here. Come on, let's give God the glory. And I'm one of those blessed people that after a year plus, hair came back. God restored me and God healed me completely in Jesus' name. But it was a very humbling moment. Very humbling moment. I don't know what God's going to bring you through for that shift to take place in your life. It may take a humbling act that He causes people to insult you. It may take a humbling act for people to not understand you and misunderstand you and, and, and you feel misunderstood in so many ways. But that humbling moment will then propel you to what is ahead through Him. He will bring you through it. He will see you through it. Even if it means this man needed to be spat on for that healing to take place. And finally is this. Out of order. You need to recognize that some things will be out of order. What do I mean by this? Another interesting portion about this scripture is it sounds like as if God's power had, was interrupted. It felt like as if God's power was interrupted and, um, and there was a glitch in the healing system. Yeah, usually when he says one time, it's healed, it's healed. Very fast one, the healing will happen. You read in the other portion of the scripture, he tells the little girl, Lalita Kumi, stand up, and the girl is resurrected. He's alive. But this one is like, pray for you. What do you see? I see people, but they're walking around like trees. And then he had to pray again. And it's not like, it's such a, such a weird, thing, weird thing to happen, you know, and their person's vision was still blur. How many of you have stepped out by faith obeyed God in what He told you to do and still felt that there was no clarity. And still felt, that's right, I see those heads. And you still felt that there was no clarity in what He wants you to do. And you still feel that it's blur, it's still all a blur. I've obeyed God, God, you told me to get out from that situation, I'm out of the situation, but what next? I don't get it, I don't understand what's going on, I, it's still so blur. This man, Jesus spat on him, Jesus prayed for him, all he could see was man walking around, like looking like trees, there, there was no, there's no clarity in that vision, there's no clarity in, in what God was doing in, that, in his life. And he needed some more prayer before he could, was healed completely. Noah, when he was asked to build the ark, he, he only obeyed at that point, at that juncture. And perhaps lots of people around him were wondering, what this man is crazy. Why is he building, building an ark when there's no rain? There was no clarity in obeying God's word. There was no clarity in obeying and following the steps of what God had asked him to do. But yet, he continued doing it. When Abraham was called out from the earth of Chaldeans, there was no clarity on how God was going to fulfill his purposes through Abraham's life. There was no clarity in King David's life when he was anointed as king as a teenager and yet had to go through so many situations after situations after situations after situations, almost to death. And he still didn't see when this was going to take place. There was no clarity in Joseph's mind, life, when he had, was given that dream. He knew that something great was going to happen. As he stepped up, he got thrown into a pit. He was sold away. He was separated from his family. It doesn't make sense. There's no clarity. And many of us have taken those steps of faith. And now you're probably in a blur, in a situation where I thought I heard God. 
tell me do this. But why is it so blur? Why is everything doesn't, doesn't look clear at all? Just because you don't have clarity doesn't mean that God is not working. Let me say that again. Just because you don't have clarity doesn't mean God has already started the work in your life. Can somebody say amen? Amen. He is already starting that work. He was already starting that work in that blind man's life. Because he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion in the name of Jesus. Amen. He will bring it to completion. And there was no clarity, but as you continue to trust the Lord, and you continue to trust the process, God brings about the clarity every single day, more and more every single day, every single month, every single year. As you continue to trust Him for this next season, the next the shift that is going to happen in your life, there will be clarity that is becoming more and more clear and until you are where you, He wants you to be. And he got that man completely healed. And it's like that. It's a process. Sometimes it's a process that God has to bring us through before we get to where he wants us to be. Sometimes the healing is progressive. It's not just overnight and that's it. You don't, don't, don't let's not pray anymore. Let's give up. Pray some more. Press in further. Because God is still able to do what he says he will do. And I love this word from the book of Mark where it says here, Jesus held his hand. It didn't say, Jesus commanded Peter, James and John to hold the blind man and walked him out of the village. Jesus personally took this man by the hand and said, brother, walk with me. Trust me. Trust the process. Walk out of this familiar place. Walk out of this familiar place. I'm going to do something in your life that I, I, don't, I don't do it the same with everybody's eyes. I'm going to pray for you in a way that, I'm, that other people may not, it may not be the same way that I've prayed for other people. I'm going to work in a way that perhaps no, no one else understands it. I want you to learn to trust me that the process of God will always come to pass and bring about His future and His purpose in your life to be completed. Amen. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but I know some of us are in the middle of that shift. Some of us are scared to step, take that first step up. I want to encourage you today. There is a corporate anointing in this house for the shift to happen. And we all need to recognize that when there is a shift, there is growth. When there is a shift, you will experience new things. Mm. If this man resisted and said, no, 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 I don't want to go, I don't want to leave my friends, I don't want to let go of what I know, I don't want, no, no, he will have never been healed at this point. But he trusted God. And I want to assure you this, Jesus will hold your hand. He will hold your hand and lead you every step of the way. As you patiently trust Him, just like Jen said, He knows God will protect Him. God will not let Him fall flat. God's protection will be upon Him. God's protection will be upon you. As you patiently wait upon Him and trust the process, that vision will become clearer and clearer and clearer. The purpose will become clearer and clearer and clearer. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Let's get the worship team out. who you are, I don't know where you're seated, I don't, I don't care 
what your position is, what your title is, whether you are in a place of victory or mountain or you're in a place where you are in the midst of a crossroad. But all of us need a shift in our lives. We need God to do something new in our lives so that we can experience His grace and His, His miraculous work in our lives all over again. Amen. Man, we're going to worship the Lord and I want those, all of us, you know, those of you, you know that you are in the middle of a shift or God is shifting you somewhere or you know you need a shift in your lives. At the count of three, I want you to very quickly make your way out to the altar. We want to pray along. Take that step of faith. Something happens at the altar. Something takes place at the altar. Yes, you can sit where you are at and God can touch you but when you take that step of faith, it's activating your faith to believe that God is doing something new in your life. So at the count of three, I want you to very quickly make your way out of your seat, whether you're in the balcony at the back or in the front, make your way out of the seat. One, two, three, very quickly make your ways out of the seat. If you want a shift, if you need a shift and you are going through a shift, we want to pray along with you as the worship team leads us in this song. Thank you, Lord. Don't wait for one another very quickly now. Quickly move out of your seats. Ask people to excuse you, excuse you, you know, and get out there because you know you need to be here. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay. It down. Come on, lay it all down Every at the feet of Jesus. Oh, Very quickly now, quickly now. Move out of your seats. Come on, all over across this sanctuary, people are coming out. Come on. Online, you know, just type in there. Just say, I need my shift. I'm going to trust God for my shift. Oh, Shikarabas. Or connect with us, you know. Let them, you know, whatever it is. If you had some of prayer requests or whatever, connect with us. Type it in that, in that connect form, you know, in the QR code there so that we can pray along with you as well. Oh, Shikarabas. Pastors, ministers, leaders who are here, please come out and let's pray for Let's stand with our brothers and sisters who will need this prayer together. Come on, seek the face of the Lord wherever you're standing. Let's make room for the Lord. Whatever you want to, do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. leaders here. Come on, let's come out and pray. Let's just trust God.
trusting you, Jesus.
all across this sanctuary, lift your hands to the Lord. That this is our prayer. We surrender our lives to you. And when we say we surrender, we are saying, God, we take you by your hand. Lead us every step of the way. Even when we don't understand, we don't understand clearly yet. But Lord, as we trust you and we take that first step, we want to see this shift in our lives. We want to see this shift in our families. We want to see this shift, of oh God, in our career. We want to see this shift, of oh God, in all the circumstances that we are going through in the name of Jesus. This is my shift. I believe it with all my heart, oh God. This is the season where, God, you're going to turn things around. And it may be uncomfortable, uneasy, unfamiliar, but God, we're going to trust you. Because we're not holding anyone's hand, but it's your hand that we hold on to so tightly as you guide us every step of the way. And there will be clarity through the days, through the months, through the years as we continue to trust in you. We give you the praise, oh God, even as we start work, many of us may be starting work this week. Some of us, oh God, we're just going into something fresh, oh God. Father, let us be a blessing. As you have blessed us, may we be a blessing to the people around us. As we continue to celebrate, as we continue, oh God, to be with people, friends, family, oh God, colleagues, Lord, let this be a season where, God, our shifts will be so felt that it will be a blessing to those around us, Lord. We thank you. We give you all the glory because you alone are worthy of it all. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus and everybody says, Amen and Amen and Amen. God bless you. Walk in the shift that God has for your life. Thank you for joining us online as well. Hello, thank you for joining us in our service today. Hope you have been blessed by the word that has been shared today and hope you've gotten a fresh perspective of God's word in your life. And if this is your first time joining us, we'd like to encourage you to fill up the form and the QR code is just below the screen. Feel free and someone will get in touch with you. And if you have a prayer request and you need someone to pray with you, we are ready to get in touch with you and to get to know what God is doing in your life. We can't wait to see you next time because this is the right place to be. Same time, same place. We want you to be blessed. See you there.